Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one from Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would draw the Chamber's attention to my entry in the Register of Interest as a practising advocate. Uh, my question is to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the conclusions of the independent review Rethinking Legal Aid. Minister Ashton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since taking up post in June, I've met with key stakeholders, including the Scottish Legal Aid Board, Faculty of Advocates, and I'm due to meet with the Law Society this afternoon to discuss relevant issues ahead of the publication of the Scottish Government's response to the review. The Scottish Government has not made any cuts to the scope of legal aid, and the review recommended that the current scope remain. As set out in our programme for government, the Scottish Government response to the report of the independent review of legal aid will be published in the autumn. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. Will the Government's plans for legal aid take account of what is being described as an extremely serious situation where there are not enough new entrants to the criminal legal aid sector to sustain the network of criminal firms providing access to justice in Scotland? And does she agree with plans being drawn up for first-year trainees to appear in court on behalf of clients? Minister. Um, regarding the issue of um, the first-year trainees, this is not a matter for the Scottish Government. That reflects an agreement made between the Lord President and the Law Society of Scotland. And our analysis of the current situation is that while crime is reducing, the number of criminal court actions is reducing. The number of criminal legal aid producers is still high in comparison to the work available. Crime has been reducing over several years, and since 2013, the number of criminal case reports to the Crown Office has reduced by nearly 39%. In the same period, the number of criminal legal aid providers has reduced by less than 16%. So, as identified in Rethink Legal Aid, there is an oversupply of providers in some areas, but we do accept that there is an undersupply in others. Ruth McGuire. The report of the Legal Aid Review suggests that the current wide scope of civil actions for which legal aid is available in Scotland should remain. Is the Minister supportive of this suggestion? Minister. Unlike our counterparts in England and Wales, the Scottish Government has kept legal aid provisions to help with family, medical, housing and welfare benefit problems. It's important that legal aid continues to offer support for these issues, which have a devastating effect on people and often those who are disadvantaged and vulnerable. And it's an important aspect of our legal aid system in Scotland and there are no plans to change that position. These areas are not covered in England, where legal aid has been intentionally and severely cut, reducing its scope. And this is yet another area where this SNP government acts to protect the vulnerable and the Conservatives do not. Yeah. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and firstly, let me welcome the Minister to her new post. Uh, I note her comments about the fallen court actions, but one of the, the points of the report is that demand is falling. Would she acknowledge the points in the report regarding simplification and improving access and awareness of legal aid, uh, considering that 70% of uh, Scots are eligible for legal aid? Minister. Obviously, the legal aid system is entirely demand-led. We have um, the review at the moment, which obviously included 67 recommendations. So um, my officials are currently looking at the number of recommendations, we are engaging with all the stakeholders on a number of issues, including the one that the member has just raised, and that will be included in the government's response, which I will publish in the autumn. Question number two, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides when a family member dies overseas. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, consular assistance, including the notification of a death abroad and subsequent advice to bereaved families, is a reserved matter for the UK Government. The Scottish Government would uh, ordinarily refer individuals to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office who work with Police Scotland in such cases. On the issue of repatriation, as this is a reserve policy area, consular assistance is provided by the FCO as set out in the public guide, support to British nationals abroad. The Scottish Government is unable to offer any repatriation services above and beyond this. Following repatriation, several organisations within Scotland can provide bereavement support for individuals in addition to the work of community support and police groups. This includes Victim Support Scotland, who have a partnership in place with the FCO for the provision of support to families. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that 
answer, there is often significant distress, uncertainty and financial cost when a loved one dies overseas. Can I draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to the fact that there's a financial cost to having that death registered back home here in Scotland or indeed anywhere else in the UK? The total cost is £200. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that given it is free to register deaths that occur here at home in Scotland, it's only right that it should be free to register deaths of loved ones when they pass away overseas. Also, will the Scottish Government work with me to secure the scrapping of such charges to put fairness and affordability into a system in such distressing circumstances? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member raises a very interesting point. When someone uh, dies abroad, the death is normally registered uh, in the country where they've died, but if the ne next of kin wants to choose to register the death in Scotland or elsewhere in the UK, um, the next of kin or the executor can make an application to the FCO in London for a consular death certificate, which will be in English. Now, applying, um, as he points out, for a consular death certificate is optional, but the cost is currently £150 for registration and £50 for a copy of the certificate. But I'm happy to uh, instruct my officials um, to look at the issue to see if there's a... I think we probably heard enough of the last, well, perhaps the Minister could send a note. I think we lost the microphone just for the, the last few comments the Minister made. Perhaps the Minister could send a note to the official report afterwards. Thank you. Question number three, Richard Lyle. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Network Rail to ensure that it responds to residents' complaints regarding rodents on the track at Kerfin Motherwell. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Sign officer, I'm aware that Network Rail and North Lanarkshire Council Environmental Health Department have already met on this matter and agreed that the railway may not, in fact, be the source of the issue. It therefore remains a matter for the Council to progress. Richard Lyle. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and recognise that Network Rail does not come under the responsibility of Scottish Ministers? But could I ask, uh, therefore, if the uh, Cabinet Secretary agrees with me that it's another example of worrying trend of UK government departments, agencies ignoring Scotland's elected representatives. And what action can we take to ensure that Network Rail and others respond to requests to attend meetings or indeed communicate both with MPs and MSPs in the community in Scotland to resolve issues that we believe they have caused and we do believe they have caused? Because by refusing to attend a recent resident meeting in Newt Hill, which I attended with over 100 people there, they have left many unanswered questions and now face a barrage of distrust within the local community. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, as a government, we uh, work closely with Network Rail in Scotland on matters that affect rail users and those living and working alongside our uh, railway network. Uh, the member is correct that Network Rail is a UK government uh, body. Um, I would expect them to uh, fully engage with local communities on issues of concern and, of course, to also engage with local authorities and local elected members on matters of concern and I would expect them to respond to the issues that Mr Lyle has raised on behalf of his constituents in a constructive and in a way that helps them to resolve the concerns of local residents. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people and to our health service. Neil Bibby. President Officer, I expect there is plenty to discuss. Accident, emergency, waiting times, cancer detection rates, cancer waiting times, dementia support, treatment time guarantee, the 18-week referral to treatment, the 12-week first outpatient appointment, staff sickness, and child mental health waiting times. Nine national standards all failed under this government, some even going backwards. We know our hard-working NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde staff are doing their best under difficult circumstances. Indeed, in many cases, they are outperforming colleagues in other parts of the country. But can I ask the new Health Secretary, when will patients in my community get the level of health and care promised to them by this government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, 
Interesting that Mr Bibby uh, likes to recite a long list. I have an equal long list of my own that I could recite, including GP numbers up by 5%, workforce up by overall by 9.5%. And my absolute intention, if Mr Bibby would care to just pause for a moment and let me finish, that might be helpful. My absolute intention to bring forward to this Parliament a plan to re significantly reduce the current waiting times. However, the fact of the matter is that none of this is assisted when, as I mentioned yesterday, we have uh, opposition colleagues deliberately looking to conflate matters. Let me give you an example. 27th of June, under the headline, Bombshell, Bombshell Board Papers Reveal Huge Cuts to NHS in Glasgow and the West, Labour conflated both financial papers and a high-level strategy paper for the Health Board in order to get a headline. That kind of behaviour is deeply unhelpful to those who work in our health service, but much more importantly, does an injustice to the constituents Mr Bibby claims he wants to represent. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is incumbent upon all politicians to put full and accurate information into the public domain so as not to try to paint an inaccurate picture, something that Labour politicians seem to already do when it comes to the future of Inverclyde Royal Hospital, and it would appear that they shut their, ear, their eyes and ears when the chairman of the NHS, Grace Glasgow and Clyde, again reiterated the Health Board's long-term commitment to the hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do. As I indicated earlier, that is absolutely my view. We undoubtedly have challenges in the health service. Opposition members have a right and a responsibility to challenge this government. But I am asking everyone to effectively raise their game here and have a bit more of a mature discussion. It is disappointing when a board chair has to use his time and energy to issue media statements to address public concerns that have been raised entirely by false speculation on the part of opposition members when time and again that board and that chair have made it clear that the future in this instance of Inverclyde Royal Hospital is secure. Now, it's not simply the colleagues on my right-hand side, colleagues on my left are also guilty of this matter, and we really do need to grow up in this parliament and deal with health in the manner in which it deserves to be dealt with. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Health Board is reviewing and redesigning breast cancer services. An FOI asked by myself revealed that they had only consulted one person about their preferred option, which is to centralise services. The Health Board said, and I quote, the Scottish Government has indicated satisfaction with a level of engagement. In the interest of the accuracy that I wish to share with the Cabinet Secretary, can she tell the Chamber, is this true? Cabinet Secretary. So, the uh, Greater Glasgow and, and Clyde Health Board have a high-level approach go, uh, entitled Going Forward Together. Ms Bailey and I have discussed this on many occasions in writing and in person. Part of that includes the work that we have undertaken and has been approved on the best start approach to maternity services. That is not about having one service only in an area like Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but with clini clinician and other advice, widely welcomed by the Royal College of Midwives and others. It's about providing the right service of support uh, in terms of uh, uh, maternity services and breast screening uh, across uh, all of our health service in Scotland. And the consultation will begin on the detail of that. Now, where we are at the moment is at a relatively high level. And can I make the point, it is the Scottish Health Council that actually provides a recommendation and a view to me as a Cabinet Secretary as to whether a board in wider ranging consultation has undertaken that properly. And in this instance, we are not yet at that stage. I fully expect us to get there, at which point I have a very strong view personally about what adequate consultation actually is. And I will ensure that across our health boards, adequate consultation with members of the public and others is fully undertaken. Question number five, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its assessment of the anticipated security of supply of medical isotopes after the UK leaves the EU. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to uh, Mr Stewart for raising this important issue again. Uh, I understand that a meeting was offered in May uh, to discuss this, ma these matters uh, further. That did not take place, but I'm happy again to make that offer. 
In a written answer in August, I said that it was imperative that the UK government continues to secure a sustainable supply of time-critical medical isotopes, which, as members will know by their very nature, de decay over a short time frame. And that supply has to be right for Scotland. I added that we were in discussions with the UK government about this issue and the UK's future relationship with Euratom. Unfortunately, the UK government has not yet been able to provide any certainty about future arrangements with the Euratom community, about future customs arrangements, or about many other aspects of future arrangements with European institutions. I completely <coughs> understand this uncertainty is a source of anxiety for medical practitioners and patients across Scotland, and we will continue to attempt to maintain contact with the UK government and continue to stress the importance of this issue. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is well aware that the UK Government is withdrawing from Euratom, which regulates the supply of radioisotopes used in the treatment of cancer. The UK has no nuclear reactors which, and relies on the importation of medical isotopes such as iodine-131 from Europe. Um, I'm very happy to meet the Cabinet Secretary to discuss this issue in more detail. The future of the treatment of our cancer patients relies on safe importation of radioisotopes, and I'll get in touch with the Cabinet Secretary uh, later on today. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Stewart for that, and I look forward to that discussion. Of course, it is not simply radioisotopes which are a matter of concern here. As Mr Russell, I believe, uh, made clear in his statement uh, earlier this week, we are talking about 8,000 suppliers of medicines, uh, not counting other devices, who have been asked by the UK government to begin stockpiling six weeks' worth of medicines. Now, as we know, it is only right and proper that we, as, as a Scottish government, take appropriate steps, and we uh, have engaged with our boards to do that, uh, in order to uh, look at how we might manage uh, a situation of uh, the, the Brexit, uh, particularly a hard Brexit, but it is also only right and proper that I say very clearly there is a limit to how much we can mitigate this. Not only is there a question in terms of radioisotopes, there are some of our medicines which, quite frankly, cannot be stockpiled. And so we should not be giving, as the UK government, I believe, is attempting to do, some sense of false preparedness for a situation that, frankly, cannot be prepared for in the manner in which they suggest. And it is only right and proper we take what steps we can, but also that we are honest and responsible with those that we represent to say there is a serious limit to how much the dangers and the catastrophe of Brexit will be mitigated against. Question number six, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the provision of perinatal mental health support. Minister Clare Hockey. I uh, thank, uh, thank James Dornan for his question. Uh, good perinatal mental health care is vitally important in improving outcomes for mothers and their young children. This is why we are funding a national managed clinical network, MCN, on perinatal mental health. The MCN brings together specialists on perinatal mental health, nursing, maternity and infant mental health. The network's long-term aim is to ensure all women, their infants and families have equity of access to the perinatal mental health services they need across all of Scotland. Additionally, as was announced last week in the programme for government, we are providing a package of measures to do more to support positive mental health and prevent ill health, which includes a quarter of a billion pounds of additional investment starting this year and progressively increasing over subsequent four years. This funding includes £50 million for perinatal mental health services to develop a strong network of care and support for the one in five new mothers, around 11,000 a year, who experience mental health problems during and after pregnancy. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for her full answer and uh, I believe uh, her first question uh, in her new role. Uh, as you'll be aware, almost 20% of women experience mental ill health during their pregnancy, so I'm grateful that the government is taking decisive action to improve the provision of perinatal mental health support in Scotland. Within the programme for Scotland, it states, and I quote, we will also substantially expand the range of perinatal support available to women. Can the minister advise on how many women they expect to benefit from these new support measures? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As James Dornan mentioned, we set out a package of commitments in our programme for government to expand the help available to new mothers who may experience a mental health issue around the time of pregnancy. And we will provide three tiers of support across Scotland in line with the needs of individuals. 
For those 11,000 women a year who would benefit from such help, such as counselling, we will support the third sector to provide this. For the 5,500 women in need of more specialist help, we will ensure rapid access to psychological assessment and treatment. And for those 2,250 women with the most severe illness, we will develop more specialist services and consider the need for a small number of additional inpatient beds or enhanced community provision. And Annie Wells. Presiding officer. In April, the Scottish Government was widely criticised after data from Mater Maternal Mental Health Alliance showed that in 50% of health board areas across Scotland, women had no access to specialist perinatal mental health services. Can the Minister assure that measures set out in the programme for government will enable this access so that women do not face a postcode lottery when it comes to perinatal health support? Minister. I thank Annie Wells for her question. Um, the Managed Clinical Network is currently carrying out a mapping and gapping exercise in support of their shorter term aims to in, uh, provide a comprehensive overview of current service provision. And the additional funding announced last week will help to uh, ensure that women are able to access the services they need when they need them.